You know, um, the issue of slavery in America is was it's very sad. It's it's bad what happened in America in that situation, and yet uh, we can see the grace of God and the power of God even in those situations. And I think that's something that we should remember. In a story like that, you can see how many. I mean, the the owner. First of all, he owned a man, <laughs> and then. He wouldn't, he wouldn't do what many, many others, in fact, if you look back in it, as Mr. Brady has said, many, many others, is when they would hear of a man being called to preach, would give him his freedom, and this guy wouldn't. But what do we see in the story? We see one bad guy, and we see God's work through two church members and, and a church up in a group of people in Philadelphia. We see all kinds of the grace of God and the power of God overcoming the evil of man. Um, in one sense, God uses the evil of man to show us the sacrifices that people are willing to give and really to help teach us the amount of sacrifice that we ought to be willing to do um, for one another also. And so, um, in a certain sense, we hear stories like that, and, and if you don't have the right attitude, and many people in America don't, I'm not saying anybody in here, but you're going to run into people who do think that when you say anything good about what happened in a situation with slaves, you're condoning the slavery. We're not excusing the slavery. We're just seeing how God overcame the evil of men. And uh, the grace of God is greater than the sin of man. And that's something to be, to be remembered whenever you hear stories like that. We don't, we're not glossing over it necessarily. But God's grace is way greater, much greater than, than the sin of man. And we should know that personally, but we can see it historically too. Acts chapter 20, and um, we're going to be looking at verses 17 through 21. Um, this is not even a whole paragraph, and there's so much here. I think I'm just going to kind of give you, um, end up just giving you an outline. You could take some notes on it and contemplate, meditate on the things that we talk about here for the week, even, I think. Uh, maybe I think this way because it really is talking about ministry, and that's what I do for my uh, my life's uh, sustenance. But really, what we're going to see is that all of us have a ministry, and we should remember that. But Acts chapter twenty, verse seventeen, the Bible says, Luke tells us, and from Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church. And when they were come to him, he said unto them, Ye know, from the first day that I came into Asia, after what manner I have been with you at all seasons, serving the Lord with all humility of mind, and with many tears and temptations which befell me by the lying in wait of the Jews, and how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have shown you, and have taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. That's pretty much two sentences there. Um, and that's where we're going to stop this morning. So the setting, of course, for this is that, that Paul is um, returning to um, Jerusalem in particular. <clears throat> I would say he's returning to Antioch, but as... If we read ahead, we see that he never got to Antioch because he left from Antioch. If you're returning somewhere, you'd be going back to where you came from. He does have an offering that each of the churches that he has planted has gathered together and sent with some uh, a representative from their church. And they're bringing an offering for the saints in, for the believers that are in <laughs> the believers that are in uh, Jerusalem and Judea, they have been in a famine and are under much uh, trouble. And so they, the other churches have brought some money or, or sent some money to help them. And so he's on this journey. Last week we just we kind of did a quick geography lesson, how he went from Troas and stopped each day along the way down here. And at the end it said that he had decided that he was going to pass by Ephesus. Now... He had spent in the last of the last five years of his life, he had spent three of them in Ephesus. And from his work in Ephesus, the whole province, the whole state, we might say, of Asia, which has about ten different churches. If we look at the church, there's at least ten major cities in Asia. And we see seven of those churches listed in Revelation. And then we also have Colossians in the Bible and uh, Hierapolis. 
uh, mentioned in Colossians. So that's two more. And there's um, anyway. So there's a lot of cities there that have been influenced and and churches planted in the neighboring villages, covered with the whole God, the whole province of Asia is touched by his three years of work in Ephesus. But he's already missed the Passover because the Jews were w- w- wanting to throw him overboard or something uh, for when he was going to go to the Passover from Corinth. And he went back up around through Macedonia and coming down. And now he wants to try to get to Jerusalem by the time of, the Pen- of Pentecost. Uh, if we recall, I think I don't remember if I mentioned this last week, hundreds of thousands of Jews would go to Pentecost each year. Remember... Pentecost, we, we might immediately, when we hear Pentecost, think of the day of Pentecost when Peter got up and preached. Well, that was effective uh, because there was people from all over the king, all over the empire there. You remember the list of languages that people knew. Well, Paul wants to be back there by Pentecost. He does have an offering to bring back there, but very likely, his, remember what his heart is? His heart is with his people. The Jews, and so he probably also sees an opportunity to preach the gospel to a whole bunch of Jewish people if he gets to be in Jerusalem by Pentecost. So he decides to skip past Ephesus. He knows that if he lands in Ephesus and goes there, he just knows his nature, he knows the nature of the people, he knows what's going on, that it would just take too long to get out of Ephesus, to find a different ship <clears throat> or whatever, and the time that he would spend there, and he would not be able to make it to Jerusalem by Pentecost. So he decides to pass by there. Now he stops in uh, Miletus, which is about 30 miles, 40 miles south of Ephesus. Um, well, I, I shouldn't say that. There's, every place I look, and I, I know you, sh- you would think that you could just look at it on a map today and figure it out, and I guess you can, but how the roads went, how they would have gone, did they take a boat back around and up and whatever. It was a, at least a day's journey, a day's journey just to, to get up to Ephesus from um, Miletus. And um, so, and apparently the, sh- the boat that he was on had to stop there. Or, uh, two other things, it was following the whims, following the desires of Paul. The, maybe, the, maybe the owner was a Christian and, would, would just, and wanted to just kind of put his boat and cargo at Paul's, um, for, up for Paul's use. Or they decided to get off and choose a different boat, um, or the boat needed to unload some stuff and load some more stuff on, and there was a few days. Anyway, so Paul then is in Miletus, not far um, from Ephesus, and he can't, he can pass by Ephesus, but he can't pass by without missing this opportunity to talk to the elders of the church at Ephesus. And so the Bible says, and from Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church. Um, and just a, a note here to just to make a note, just to point out, uh, maybe it's news to some, maybe it's confirmation to others. You see there that these are called elders. They are the leadership of the church at Ephesus. If you look down in verse 28, he's, in a, he's, he's speaking to them, and he calls them another name. He says, over whom, uh, something like, uh, over whom God hath made you overseers. Okay, and now those are two different words. I mean, they're two different words in English, and they're two different words in the language that Paul was speaking when he said that. Um, elders is the word presbyteros. Um, you kind of recognize Presbyterian. Um, Right? Presbyteros and Presbyterian. It's based on the same word. And it means in someone who is mature, elder, um, um, has uh, characteristics of being uh, serious, um, not, uh, in contrast, not a novice. <laughs> right? So they're an elder. Um, but it was, um, it was an office also. They were the leadership of the church. And then overseers is the Greek word episkopos. And lo and behold, we recognize that word too, right? Episcopal would come from that word episkopos. And that has the idea of the overseer is, is somebody that is, is ruling. Okay? They are, they're, they're ruling and making decisions and saying this needs to be done and this needs to be done. An overseer, um, you know, maybe... I, I, 
I didn't study this out, but I imagine like a foreman or somebody who's overseeing a work says, this needs to be done. No, don't do that. Do this. And that would be the office um, that these people, these men who were elders um, were also overseers. And we don't have the time to do a complete study on it, but there's um, the, the idea of pastors or shepherds and, um, um, and bishop. All four of those words are always described, are all, are not always used in every situation, but they're often used interchangeably for one uh, office in a church, and that's the office of a pastor, what we would call a pastor today. So anyway, that is um, kind of just a preliminary note that this is one of those passages where we see two terms describing the same office. So he calls these men, and I would just note that that he, there's it's plural. There's more than one here. He, there's several there in the church at Ephesus that are helping this church and um, he calls them down I don't it doesn't say how many but if you go later on it says they all fell on his neck and wept maybe it's just me but I it's more than two because it probably would have said they both fell on his neck there's there are several that are there um, for this final talk now he had already said farewell to them at the beginning of the chapter but he, because he, at that point he thought he was going to go from Corinth to Jerusalem. Now he gets to come back by and he wants to speak to the elders at least this last time. And he begins in verse 18 then and describes what I, and does what I would say is describes his ministry. Um, so let's just start there where he says, uh, and, and when they were come to them, he said unto them, Ye know from the first day that I came into Asia what manner... I have been with you at all seasons, observing the Lord with all humility of mind and with many tears and temptations, which befell me by the lying in way of the Jews, and how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have shown you and have taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, that's not the end of the paragraph, but I see four things there. In verse 18, I see that his ministry was observable. They knew him. It wasn't like he, um, it wasn't like he went into his wherever he stayed all week long and then came out and stood in the pulpit on Sunday morning and told him what to do and then went back into his, um, I think this is the, not the proper term for a man, but into his cloister, you know, and, and stayed there and then came back out the next week. He worked among them. They knew him from the very day he arrived there. So it was observable. We'll go back and look at some of those other things there. And then he looked at his ministry as service to God. In verse 19, he says, serving the Lord. Okay, he wasn't, he wasn't serving them or whatever. He was serving the Lord. And then in verse 20, he says, I kept back uh, nothing or... Is that what it says? Um, yeah, I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you. And so it was teaching his, what he did toward them was teaching. And then in verse 21, he talks about how he was testifying to uh, the Jews and the Greeks. Uh, so it was evangelistic also, testifying, teaching, service, and it was observable. So let's look at then at verse 18. In verse 18, we see that he says, You know, from the first day that I came into Asia, after what manner... I've been with you at all seasons. So he points out that they knew him. Uh, he had a, he lived a transparent life. He lived among them. He, they knew um, the rest of the stuff that he says in this um, address that he gives to them. And as a side note, you might, you, if, if you were able to, I haven't done this. I heard it and I, I believe the person that told me this. Uh, almost every single phrase in these 12 verses or 15 verses is also used in several other of Paul's letters. So this speech here in Acts, in Luke's writing of Acts, parallels um, all, all the rest of Paul's letters. So it's very similar in that way. But anyway, so he says, um, and so the rest of things, like things that he says where he worked with his own hands and, and all of those things, they knew him. Um, he was, they knew it because he was there and he was observable. He worked in the midst of them. He didn't say, well, I'm an apostle, so you guys go do this stuff and I've got this uh, important work to do um, that nobody can know about and, and really it's too, it's too deep for you all to be a part of. I'm going to do it. Um, 
So he was, they knew him because they were there. Uh, he was there with them. And it's from the first, from the very day, he says, from the, from the first day that I came into Asia, he got there way back in um, the chapter before <laughs> in, the, uh, in, 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 the, in the scriptures. And he met those 12 who thought they were disciples of John. And then he taught in the synagogue. And then he taught in the school of Tyrannus. And there's all the different things there that were, that were going on. The, the, um, the casting demons out and healing people. All of that. He, from the very first day, he was consistent. All the way through there, he was there. And they, what they knew was his manner. After what manner I have been with you. His lifestyle. How he lived. And I think it's interesting, says, in all seasons. Now we could imagine, of course, we think first when we hear the word season of winter, spring, summer, fall. I don't know if they have four seasons there in, uh, in Turkey or three, you know, if they have planting and growing and harvesting or what, I don't know. But, but that surely is what he's saying there, but, but that's like covered in from the first, from the day I arrived. What other kind of seasons would Paul have been in? He would have been in seasons of prosperity, seasons of spiritual blessing. He would have been in seasons of persecution. What was it like? They saw him when the, uh, when the theater was full of 20, 25,000 people chanting, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. They saw him as he wanted to go in there and, and, try to calm them down and preach the gospel to 20 to 25,000 people at one time. They saw him whatever circumstances he was in, in all seasons, whether they were hard seasons or blessed seasons or just the same as the day before seasons. They saw his manner of life in all seasons. And that's, um, that's there's in a certain sense, there's not too much um, instruction that we can get from that. Uh, not as much as the rest, but we can grow. We can understand from that. We, uh, when we're whoever we minister to, and every one of us should be ministering to people. We'll get to that in the next verse. But all of us are ministering to people. We um, we have a ministry in our church to other people, whether it's in in a formal class type ministry or uh, whatever type of work that the church has organized. Or whether it's just from member to member, um, we're members one of another. Uh, we're we're part of the church and members in particular. Um, so we have ministry to one another. We have ministry within our church. But we have ministry in our family. God has placed you in a family in a certain in a certain position, and you have a ministry in that family. You have a ministry at work. Um, then God has placed you in your place at work. He's put you in a certain position. Whether it is whatever position you have, whatever job title you have, God's put you there and you have a ministry there. Um, whatever you want to say. So, and people ought to know you um, from the ministry. In your ministry, they ought to know you and you ought to strive to have a consistent ministry. Um, and know that, you know, in one sense, also know that people are watching you. Then, what does he say about his ministry? Verse 19, he says, serving the Lord. He looked at his ministry as service to the Lord. Boom, I'm serving the Lord. He could talk about all the people that were there. He could talk about uh, the different people that he had healed. But uh, he, could talk about, he could think about a lot of individuals there. And I'm sure he does think of them. He knows them. Um, but he looks at his ministry as service to the Lord. I could think about you, and I do think about you. I think about the lesson that I'm going to prepare, and I, I think about Sam and like how long should the lesson be. <laughs> um, but, uh, but I shouldn't be too worried about that type of thing because my service here is to you, but really it's to God, right? And all of us should be this way. And I want to just take a minute and... Um, Go aside a little bit to Colossians, where because I think this would be helpful to us to remember this. Uh, for some, this might be news, but I think for most of us, we should just be remembering this. In Colossians chapter 3, um, right after uh, the Lord speaks to wives and husbands and children, Colossians chapter 3, he speaks to wives and husbands and children. Right after that, in the same paragraph, he speaks to servants in verse 22. 
And in our culture today, we should just think, whenever we see servants there, we should think employees. Okay? So he says, and let's just substitute that word in our mind right now. Employees, obey in all things your employers, right? Employ your, your employers according according to the flesh. I mean, who, who's your boss? Who's your... Not with eye service as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart, fearing God. And whatsoever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord, and not unto men, knowing that of the Lord you shall receive the reward of the inheritance. Now, you know, you're sitting there, if you don't have the right attitude about this, you say, yeah, but the Lord doesn't sign my paycheck. Okay? But, who do you serve? What is the, the next verse? For, or the next phrase, for ye serve the Lord Christ. In your job, in your work, you serve the Lord Christ. Um, this understanding swept through the world in the early and mid 1500s and it changed the world. Okay? It's a little history, but theology affects history. What you believe affects things. Before that time, not entirely, but for about a thousand years before that time, people just did their job. They, didn't, they, said, they thought they were serving a man, and that man was cruel to them, and they didn't, and they didn't care to help him out. But when a person believes God and understands that whatever work they're doing, wherever God has placed them, they're serving God in that work. If they're um, uh, making a pair of shoes, they're making that pair of shoes the way God would want them to make those pair, that pair of shoes. Um, who was it? I don't know if it was Thursday night in class or... Sometime I was sitting right there where I was sitting and somebody was talking about um, uh, the, 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 the one guy that had to soak the leather and pound it out till it was completely dry and, he, and the other, he saw his, uh, his boss's competitor didn't... Um, that was Pastor Dameron was saying that, wasn't he? And it didn't, he didn't pound the, all the water out and the shoe didn't last as long. But the customers came back more frequently. Why did he, why was, one guy was a Christian, okay? He knew that his service was to the Lord, uh, and that was a boss, but either way, um, we serve the Lord in our work, and for that matter, <laughs> um, verse 1 of chapter 4 says, Masters, give your servants that which is just and fair, we might say, or and equal, knowing that ye also have a master in heaven. So, uh, who, if you have a master, you serve him, right? So even employers, Mar Marvin is an employer, right? He has a master. He has somebody he serves. And he serves that master. Mr. Brady is an employer. A lot of you are employers. You have people that work underneath you. Your, 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 your being an employer to them, you have an employer. You have somebody you serve. And so you want to, so you want to be serving your employees like God serves you. Um, as God would treat you. So, our service, Paul said he's serving the Lord, and we should remember that even today, regardless of whether we get a paycheck from Fairhaven Baptist Church or something like that, all of our work for God, all of our work is for God. We, we, we are tend, as American Christians, to think, well, I have work for God, and then I have work for... Um, for me, work, I, I gotta take care of my family. I know I need to be a Christian, blah, blah, blah. But even your work, all of our work is for God. And so, how did Paul serve the Lord? He served the Lord with humility. Um, oops, I'm still looking at Colossians. Acts. Serve the, serving the Lord with all humility of mind. We need to remember that. God blesses us. When we serve Him, He blesses us. And then we start thinking, that we're the, we're the ones that, you know, caused this blessing to come. We think that we're so, um, our ideas. If you serve God in your work, you will be blessed. You're going to think, how would God do this? Well, I'll tell you something. If you really strive to work the way God would work, and you try to follow His principles and, and, and His Word, you're going to be blessed because God is successful. I don't know, that's kind of, isn't He? God has never failed at a single thing. I'm not saying, 
I'm not saying that you won't have trials coming in your life, but if you're following the Lord and, and biblical principles, you're going to be successful. And if you're a human being, you're going to be tempted to be, take pride in that. And say, oh, I'm, look at how successful I am. Hum, serving the Lord with humility of mind, whether and, and, and I'm taking it to uh, what we would call the, the secular realm, but even in our church realm. We can look at this big building. This big auditorium. There's other ones that are bigger, but we have been greatly blessed by God. Is it because of us? Is it because of me? Is it because of Pastor Dameron? Is it because of my father? All the years of work? It's not. It's none of that. That's not where the blessing came from. The blessing came from God. We serve the Lord, and we have to remain and remember to stay humble with humility of mind. And then he says, with tears... We could uh, look up the different times when Paul says he, he shed tears. He shed tears over the lost. He shed tears over wayward Christians. The, the, the book of um, First Corinthians, in 2 Corinthians, he says he wrote 1 Corinthians with tears because of all the trouble that the Corinthians were in and, and, and the, the rebuke that he had to give them. Um, so there's, there's tears and then there's temptations. Uh, the temptations there, we should understand that word as a trial, um, because think of where, look at where the temptations came from. Temptations, um, which befell me by the lying and way of the Jews. So he's not talking about, um, moral temptations. He's talking about a trial. Uh, 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 you know, the lying, the, the Jews lied and wait, laid and wait for him, trying to catch him and, and kill him. Uh, capture them, take them to whatever they wanted to do. Those are the temptations. And he mentions the Jews. Well, there's also the riot in Ephesus. In another place, he says he fought with beasts at Ephesus. We don't know if that is um, literal or a, a, a literary a figure of speech. But either way, um, all these trials, he was he served the Lord through all of those things. Um, so. Then we will see, so he, his ministry was service to God. And then in verse 21, he says, I'm sorry, in verse 20, he says, And how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have shown you and have taught you publicly and from house to house. So he was, it, was, it was a ministry of teaching. He kept back nothing that was profitable unto you. You know, some things that are profitable to us, we don't really like. Okay? But Paul, if it was profitable, he was going to give it to us. You know, if, if Paul was our pastor. And that happens to us, doesn't it? Our human nature doesn't like something, and yet somebody knows that it's really what we need. Your kids don't like certain things, that you know it's what they need. Um, and so that's the way God is with us. God chastens us for our good. It's for our profit. And anybody who ministers to someone else is going to teach Going to it might be rebuke, reprove, exhort, and it might not be something that we like. But Paul taught them the things that were profitable to them, and we might say, "What is profitable? What is profitable?" It should be a, a, a verse should come to mind right away, right? How many have a verse came to mind? Right? What is it? All right? All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. So, and, and later on he does say this, but so Paul is preaching all of Scripture. Everything is profitable. And he showed them, he showed them and then taught, showed you and taught you. So he, he showed them this is what it is, and then he went behind that and taught, like this is how you do it. Publicly and from house to house, you know, up in public and personally, and then testifying um, both to Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. So we see his teaching those that were, we would say, saved, and his testifying or his evangelizing those that are not saved. Testifying to the Jews and the Greeks, repentance and faith. This is repentance and faith. You can't have one without the other. Um, and so, that is just another reminder. It's a great summary there of what the gospel is. And um, we should be wanting in our ministry to be serving God, 
teaching those that he's placed in our in our care and testifying test, uh, testifying evangelizing anybody without you know like you know the Jews or the Greeks we don't have Jews and Greeks he, here but we have classes of people we have people in our minds say oh I I can testify to that person but I don't know about that person whatever um, it, Paul was without um, prejudice I don't know if that's the right word but I think it gets the idea across he testified to all and and he testified the the whole gospel and uh, I think that we we understand this but I think that there's so much around us that is preaching a false gospel or an incomplete gospel that it's good for us to remember what the what the gospel is and it's repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ